Hello everyone, I'm uh, Astyanax, and I love uncertainty. I love uncertainty. I didn't always love uncertainty. I first encountered uncertainty about the same age that most of you are in. I studied computing in the late 90s. In the late 90s, the World Wide Web was becoming really popular. You had Amazon that was actually becoming very popular. You had Google being set up. So I could see the tech sector as a rocket ship that was going places. And I wanted a place in that rocket ship. Unfortunately, what you want and what actually ends up happening is not always the same. So the graph that you see there, these are the tech stocks, the technology stocks in the US around the time that I was studying. I decided to look for a job right there. So when I was applying for jobs, the companies that I was applying to were actually going out of business. That did not work out so well. So the internet bubble burst. It took me some time to get my footing. It took me some time to come to terms with uncertainty. So after many years, I say, OK, as the annex, you're feeling adventurous again. That's great. Let's try something different this time. Let's try banking. Banking has been around for thousands of years. It cannot go wrong. So I go to the US. I study in business school. I start employment right there. So I actually, in the first week of training of my employment, that's when the financial crisis officially started. My parents told me never go back to university, by the way. So you could say, OK, that's fine. You, know, you went to a bank. Many banks survived. You know, they get bailouts. They're around. Not really. They're not around. So after this experience, that was obviously quite painful for me. There was a lot of uncertainty. But around that time, that whole situation around the financial crisis made many people lose trust to institutions, to government, to central banks, to very large corporations. There were some very clever people that lost trust. And these very clever people decided to find a way to take the central party, a government, a state, out of the equation, to create a life possible without them. So when we think about technology, technology typically creates uncertainty. It creates uncertainty because it's something new, something that is not fully proven, something we don't know how it's going to develop. Typically, we talk about AI, machine learning. It's very easy to understand, even if you don't know a lot about this, how it can affect you. It can affect your employment, the way you actually interact with people, even if you're going to be control of the human race anymore. But there's one technology that is slightly more difficult to explain, that also is equally revolutionary, and that's blockchain. Now, to increase uncertainty in the success of my speech, I'm going to try to explain blockchain in the next five minutes. Sounds good? Okay, let's do this. So you guys were ordering food before. Let's say that I work in a kitchen, and you have a sous chef comes in and says, Astyanax, I want an omelette with tomato, peppers, and I don't know, salami. I'm like, yes, chef. I go, I start preparing something. I come back after half an hour. Here's the moussaka. Clearly, there is a problem. The sous chef ordered an omelette with many things. I prepared the moussaka. Now, what happens is that then we have to call the chef, so the authority in the kitchen, say, hey, chef, you know, we have this problem. I prepared the moussaka. He ordered an omelette. We check the orders of what happened. We say, OK, it was actually an omelette. As the annex, just try not to keep your Greek roots in control and stop doing moussaka all the time. So, this is one case where two parties have a different reality. And that different reality affects how they cooperate. And to resolve that difference, they have to go to a central authority, like the chef, to help them reconcile between the two realities. Let's make it more tangible. I am a banana smoothie company. Banana smoothie company, I run out of bananas. I order 10 containers of bananas for $100. They're really cheap bananas. What happens is that after a month, I get four containers of peaches. I cannot do anything with that. I have to call the company, find out why I got peaches, why I'm being charged more. And eventually, if we cannot reconcile the different view of reality, we have to go to a central trusted authority, like the courts of a country, to reconcile it.
to basically find a solution that, you know what, yes, he, the guy ordered bananas. I mean, he cannot make, make banana smoothies with peaches. So, difference in realities, how it's problematic, and how you use a central counterparty to resolve that. Now, what blockchain technology does is extremely powerful, extremely simple, and extremely elegant. And I'm going to try to say what happens at the high level in the next minute. Remember we talked about different realities. The key thing that blockchain technology does is that with mathematics, using mathematics, it instills the same reality across every single participant of an ecosystem. The same reality. It does not stop there. It takes that reality, it captures it in a block, and puts it in a chain with previous blocks attached to it. Then after 10 minutes, it moves on, captures the reality, puts it in a block, in a chain connected to the previous block. 10 minutes, same thing. So not only you have the same reality between all participants, but you also have the same history, the same immutable history, because you cannot change the chain, you cannot remove the blocks, and you cannot change the contents of the blocks. That's fine, you know, we talk about blocks, realities, but how do we make some money? Well, let's do exactly that. When we think about money, there is two challenges in creating money. One is the problem of double spend, namely that I spend the same $5 with you and the same $5 with you. The second problem is how do we control the creation of money? What you have now in your pockets, some of you may have, actually I have stopped using uh, physical notes quite a few years ago. You have some notes that these are physical money. When you give out physical money, you cannot double spend it, you've given it to someone. At the same time, the central bank of the European Union, or ECB to be precise, controls the creation of that money. Now, how can we do this using blockchain technology? First of all, double spending. If I spend five cryptocurrencies, I cannot spend it again. Because remember, we have the same view of truth. The moment I spend it, everyone knows about this. At the same time, I cannot reverse time and go back and change something so I can spend the money again, because I cannot change history. It's immutable. So double spend is removed. How do we create money in cryptocurrencies? Remember I told you that the blocks of history are created periodically in a set manner, every, let's say, 10 minutes, and no one can change that. So block created, you move on, block created, etc. So what, ha what they did, these very clever guys, they attached the creation of money to the creation of each block. So every single time a block is created, five new bitcoins are created. Again, five new bitcoins are created. So you have a very transparent view of how currency is created, which is known to everyone, and it's predictable. This is extremely powerful for one key reason, that in describing how blockchain solves this problem, there is no central bank, there's no government, there's no big banks, there's no corporations. There's no central counterparty. Now, we talk about money, but something which is even more important is identity. Nowadays, identity follows a very simple centralized protocol. I am born, I get a birth certificate, the birth certificate turns into an ID, into a passport. For most of us in this room, it's taken for granted that government will actually give us an ID, will give us a passport. But let's think about the people, first of all, that are born in countries torn from war. There's no state, there's no government. There's no one to give them a passport, an ID, a birth certificate. These people officially do not exist. Equally painful is the case of citizens of authoritarian regimes. If you don't agree with the regime, the regime can choose to remove you. Officially, actually, they can remove you. They can remove your existence. So, these people that we're talking about, how do we remove government out of the way? How actually do we make things, how do we revolutionize the way that we work together? 
they came up with the idea of self-sovereign identity. Simply put, what that is, is essentially an identity that is created by a number of attestations of your being. To put it very bluntly and plainly, I must the annex. Thodoris just said that I must the annex, so that's an attestation. My employer says I must the annex, that's another attestation. A government may say that, a bank may say that, and I collect all these attestations, and this collectively bring together an identity, my identity. That identity is not connected to a central party, not to one institution, not to one government. Now, how does that bring uncertainty to states? I would like you to think about the following scenario. You live a life where you use a currency that is created by you, other people around the world, maybe companies around the world, many other entities. You can use that currency to purchase everything you need to go through life. You can purchase your healthcare, you can purchase your education, you can have your pensions in that currency. What if your identity is given by the same group? Again, other people around the world, companies, anyone, not one, that's the key thing, not one. In that thought experiment, let's say you go through that life. How does that change the relationship that you have with people that are geographically around you? That right now are your compatriots, you know, their fellow Greeks, fellow French people, fellow British people, etc. Are you more connected with the people that you use the same currency with, that you have the same identity, or with the people that you're traditionally connected to, purely because you're in the same geographical space and you have the same color of skin even? These are questions that are really torturing governments. If you think about money, I'm going to give you an example, going back to Euro. The Euro, apart from a monetary move, a monetary experiment, it's also a political one. By putting the same currency in all of our pockets around Europe, we create a stronger bond with something which is called European Union. What if we had another currency that was not about a European Union, it was about something else? What would happen to the existing bond that we have with our countries, with the European Union? Governments around the world are not coming to terms with this new reality in, uh, let's say, a productive or nice manner. <laughs> I have to say that actually they hate uncertainty. And they hate uncertainty to the extent that if we take cryptocurrencies, for example, they have taken a very conservative step of regulating them. The regulation of cryptocurrencies and the use of cryptocurrencies, it's a complete patchwork. Some countries do not allow it, some others do, but in specific cases, some other countries think it's a commodity. At the same time, while all this is happening with countries trying to find their footing, the cryptocurrency market has a value which is equal to the GDP of Greece. At some point, they had a value that was equal to three times the GDP of Greece. Let's take now identity. Identity, <laughs> the governments are even further behind. They have not even come to terms with digital identity. And while all this is happening, there are people out there in serious need of identities. People from war-torn countries, people coming from authoritarian regimes, and this, even though there is technology to help them out there, still there's no support for that technology. I cannot say to governments what to do. That would be quite presumptuous and quite pompous. I am pompous, but not that much. What I can say, though, is that from my own experience, the first thing is that you cannot predict uncertainty. If you try to predict uncertainty or forecast it, you're going to go insane. The second thing is that the only thing you can do is derive a set of principles to deal with uncertainty when that comes knocking on your door. And these principles for most governments do not exist. Third thing is that governments need to act. They need to embrace uncertainty. They need to embrace its beauty. A certain life is a life where we know every single part of the future in front of us. And what a boring life that would be. Thank you very much.